Hi folks, it's Ron and welcome back to the channel and another part of my residential network cabling series of uh, videos I'm trying to put out there for you. And hopefully you're learning something uh, new from each of these different videos. And this is actually part five of, I'm not sure how many parts this is it going to be in, but it's going to cover UTP cable installation and a little bit about uh, category wire, that kind of good stuff, and what to think about when purchasing and installing it. And um, one of the, the interesting things in this industry is the acronyms are, go out the wazoo as far as the types of acronyms we might have in this industry. And uh, so a lot of people get kind of confused based just off of uh, some words we use like propagation delay and delay skew and uh, nearing crosstalk and all these other little things. And I'll talk a lot about that stuff and we talk about testing of category cables towards probably the, the, the end of these series of videos. But uh, it just want, I just want to talk about the cabling itself and hopefully lay bare some of the uh, uh, things you should know and don't know about uh, this cabling as you're buying and, and, and uh, using the type of cables. Now, as a general term for all category wires, we refer to it as a UTP or unshielded twisted pair. And obviously you can buy shielded versions, which is STP. And as far as argument between shielded and unshielded, you know, we'd like to think a properly installed, uh, properly uh, it's, it's terminated a UTP system should not have the need for shielding. Now, if you're in a noisy electrical environment or you have a reason to go for shielding, uh, shielding your cable helps cure several little problems as far as outside noise bothering what's going on inside the cabling. Uh, might be a little bit more money, but as a general rule, really not a whole lot harder to terminate. But uh, uh, so basically, two types of, of uh, wire there you got. Now, when you look at all those cables, uh, they will have four pairs as a general rule in them, and uh, those four pairs are color coded. They're blue, orange, green, and brown. And line one is supposed to be line you know blue, and line two is supposed to be orange. Line three is supposed to be green, and line four is a line, uh, a brown is line four. And so, uh, and if you want to know more about wire color code configurations, I certainly have a couple of videos up on that, especially as we talk about terminating, you know, category wires and that kind of stuff on the channel. And um, the colors are part of the standard. So, you know, the, do you have to make line one blue? The answer is no. More than likely, any color would work, but somebody in, coming in behind you would expect line one to be blue. Now, it says here on the screen that the pairs reduce crosstalk and noise in a signal. And uh, crosstalk or noise is signal being generated from one conductor to another and actually interfering with that other conductor. You can actually induce a signal into a conductor. And uh, I bet you a lot of y'all have been on a phone line in your lifetime and you're talking to somebody in the background. You can faintly hear somebody else talking in the background. Very simply, you've got two telephone pairs sitting very close together in a bundle. I'm going to put a current down a conductor. It's going to radiate that magnetic field. That magnetic field induced a little bit of voltage into that other pair, and that's what you faintly heard was this other uh, conversation. And in an old phone circuit, uh, not such a big deal. But in data, uh, it's a big deal. So we got to eliminate this. So how do we do that? And uh, one way of doing that, believe it or not, is to twist the pairs. And one big difference between cattery wire and UTP cabling and uh, old phone wire is that the old phone cables were not twisted. The pairs were not. So... And uh, the more we twist, the more we tend to eliminate. And the way it does that is uh, uh, we actually inject a signal down a pair of conductors to send that signal to another uh, device. Now, basically what they'll do is they'll take part of that signal and inject it into one of the two conductors on that cable. They have a means of inverting the signal on the other half that cable. So the two uh, uh, signals being sent are equal in strength, but they're, they're different in polarity. And so the tense... The two magnetic fields that those two conductors create are opposite in polarity and at the same strength. And when we twist the conductors, to the pairs together, uh, that tends to cancel. And the more we twist, believe it or not, the more we uh, eliminate. And that's the, really the big difference in all the category wires you'll find out there as far as what's the difference between CAT3 and 5E is they, they twist the pairs quite a bit more. And we'll talk about twisting of pairs as we go forward here. Now... Uh, it also mentions here that it has a varying parallel, and essentially what they'll do is they twist all four pairs at a different rate and then twist those together at a specific rate as well. And, uh, and it can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer how they actually twist the conductors. Standards don't really try to tell them how to do it. It's just that uh, they tell them what it should be able to do once they get done manufacturing the cable. And as long as they've done that, they don't really care how they made the cable per se. Uh, so um, uh, so each pair is twisted slightly different. And the reason we do that is because if we twisted all the pairs, 
at the same rate, the electrons would travel, be down, travel down all four pairs at the same rate, and we again would be getting more and more noise or crosstalk. And uh, applications like Ethernet allows 50 nanoseconds of delay between the fastest and the slowest pairs, because the more we're twisting in the conductors, obviously the longer those pairs have to be versus the ones that aren't as twisted as much. Okay. Now, the insulation they use uh, for the uh, conductors in this cable can vary from manufacturer. They mentioned poly uh, olefin here, but it could be other things. We'll talk about what riser cable is, and that's what the CMR stands for, or plenum riser cable we'll talk about here in a minute. In a minute. And it's basically just the fire rating of the jackets, but uh, we'll talk about that more in a second here too. And again, as a general rule, all these wires are generally 24 gauge. However, at Cat 6 and beyond, we've gone to 23 gauge on the conductors, but normally 24. Now, all uh, UTP type cables are what's referred to as balanced twisted pairs. And uh, as I said a second ago, what they do is they uh, send those signals down a, a pair Half the signals go down one conductor, half down the other conductor, and again, they're balanced and, and twisted at a certain rate. Now, this type of cable construction is very resistant to outside noise or interference causing problems on that cable. Uh, coaxial cable, I think I mentioned on an earlier series, is considered to be unbalanced, and it's very susceptible to outside noise. So, um, category wire is not that way. So, uh, you can actually get a little closer to power lines than you would coax. Now... Uh, it's considered to be a 100 ohm cable, uh, and uh, that means the connectors and the routers or switches or whatever it is that they that run uh, this signal goes through are also referred to as 100 ohm as well. And you'll actually find out in the specifications it's it's written for 100 ohms plus or minus 15 percent. So the system is designed to take a very big swing in impedance, but uh, keep in mind anytime we see a difference in impedance, it's a bump on a road basically to the signal and. Most of the signal gets past that bump, but some gets reflected back at us, which is another parameter we measure, which is called return loss, which we'll talk about later. So, uh, obviously, we don't want a lot of, bump, a lot of bumps in the road. So, uh, but you'll find that Ethernet is a very robust system. They actually designed it, uh, the cabling system, to, for it to be a, really a tank, so to speak. Now, when you look at a little bit of the history here, of these category levels and things like that, the different types of wires that have been around, um, two main parameters we'll look for when we're comparing cables, and one is the frequency range of the cable. It's referred to as the bandwidth of the system, and the higher that number is, the bigger the bandwidth, the bigger the pipe necessarily is, and the more information we can pass through the pipe. So uh, that's one key parameter. And the other key parameter here is the data rate, or the information carrying capacity of the cable. And you'll find a lot of these cable systems or cables were designed for certain applications like 10 base T Ethernet systems or 100 base T or whatever the, the, the system it was trying to support. Now, in the late 80s, uh, Annexter actually came out with what's called the Level Program. And uh, they came out with what's called Level 1 Cable, and which is basically old telephone wire, old quad wire, never meant for data work, uh, phone basically only. And then uh, they also came out with what's called level two type cable, which is really the kind of the first one cable uh, data wire you'll find out in the industry. And it was only rated for one megabit of speed and uh, uh, at one megahertz in frequency. Now, uh, CAT3 comes out and I don't know, it was late 80s, early 90s, whatever it was. And uh, CAT3 wire was really designed to support uh, 10 base T Ethernet systems, and uh, you'll see the application on the right over here says 10 base T, and it has a frequency range of 16 megahertz and a throughput of 10 megabits per second. If now again everything's working perfectly, kind of thing. Okay. Now, uh, Cat4 cable came out, and it was really kind of pushed by IBM and supported refer, referred to old token ring data systems, and uh, you won't find it anymore. By the way, you won't find level one or two anymore either. Uh, and uh, so, and you can see that the frequency went jump to 20 megahertz and up to 16 megabits per second, but it died very fast. Can, then category five wire comes out, and it was designed to support uh, 100 base T Ethernet systems, which are uh, the next rung up the ladder for, that, for Ethernet. And so we went from 10 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second. And uh, so Cat 5B cable supported 100 megabits per second, essentially Ethernet. And at 100 megahertz in frequencies, so the pipe significantly got bigger over Category 3. Now, uh, you'll find uh, that um, Cat5 cable um, was not quite capable of supporting gigabit Ethernet at the time. 
And so over a very short period of time, I'm talking just a handful of years, you know, gigabit Ethernet comes out of the market. And a lot of people had already rewired their uh, buildings uh, with Cat5 cable. And uh, we're finding out we're having a little problem with Cat5 cable. And so they came out with Cat5e cable. And uh, E means enhanced. And uh, you'll notice still rated for 100 megabits or megahertz in frequency. The frequency did not go up on the cabling. But because of the way we're doing our twisting in the pairs, it's tighter on Cat5e versus was Cat5. It could support gigabit Ethernet when it came out. And so we needed a cable that could not only support, you know, 10 and 100 base T, but something that might take us to the future. So that's, again, when 5e came out. And uh, and uh, gigabit Ethernet at that time was very brand new, not a whole lot of installations uh, well, installed with it yet, but it was it was coming toward the future. And physically, what's the big difference between Cat three and and five and five E? It is essentially the twisting of the pairs. And Cat three depends on who you bought and and uh, what pair it particular it was. Uh, you might three three or four, maybe five or six twists in a foot in the cables. Uh, Cat five may have gotten into the mid to low teens in twist rates per foot. Five E again, depending on who you buy it, could be probably high teens, maybe low twenties in twists per foot. Uh, Cat 6, which is the next rung up the ladder, uh, uh, you'll find maybe mid to high 20s, maybe low 30s and twist rates. And 6A, that stuff's really twisted. You're, you're talking 40, 50, 60 times a foot, uh, so it's twisted pretty tightly. And uh, so um, 5E is king for a, a number of years there. And, um, in, you know, how do cable manufacturers kind of differentiate themselves from other cable manufacturers? is they will move, make a souped-up version of Cat5e uh, cable. So Cat5e says it only has to be ready for 100 megahertz, but can support a, a gigabit Ethernet. Uh, but a lot of manufacturers were making cable higher grade than that, and of course the argument is always putting the best quality cable you can when the walls are down, because you'll be ripping it out somewhere down the road. So uh, a lot of manufacturers were making Cat5e rated to 250 megahertz and beyond. And uh, so after a number of years go on here, and and the transition to gigabit Ethernet become uh, pretty uh, uh, prevalent in the industry in the late 1980s. Basically, we came up with a Cat6 rating. I mean, cable manufacturers were already making a cable better than 5E, and we needed a cable specifically kind of for Cat6 or uh, gigabit Ethernet installations. So a uh, Cat6 cable is really a cable designed for gigabit Ethernet. And you'll notice on the chart, it's ready for 250 megahertz, which so they two and a half times the size of the pipe. And uh, but the speed's the same, hundred meg uh, thousand megabits, right? And the reason is because there's nothing faster than that right now. That as far as a a standard is kind of concerned, right? So here we are, a number of years later down the road, uh, and uh, ten gigabit Ethernet becomes a, a uh, something that actually is happening in the industry. And so um, Cat six will it support ten gig applications? And the answer to that is it could. Now, will it support it to 100 megahertz in freak, uh, 100 meters in length, I should say? The answer is we don't know. Probably not. You'd have to test. Okay? So if we were going to, if we need a new cable for this new thing called 10 gigabit or uh, 10, base T, 10 gig base T Ethernet, um, uh, so we came up with Cat6A cable here just a couple of years ago. It got, became kind of a ratified, approved uh, thing. And so it's ready for 500 megahertz in frequency, uh, so two times what Cat6 was and is ready to support, again, 10 uh, gig base T data networks, or 10 mega, thousand megabits per second, okay? Now, just so you know, uh, there is a Cat7 in Europe, uh, very similar to what we have here as far as 6A is concerned, uh, and we are on the beginning of Cat8, and I'm hearing, and it's going to support 40 gigabits per second, is the speed for 40 gigabit uh, base T data networks over copper cable systems, Right now, the standard, they're looking at maybe over 50 meters, not 100 meters, because uh, uh, a lot of these backbone cables don't, don't need to be 100 meters in length. Um, so who knows when exactly this is going to get approved, but we're talking in the next probably year or two. So maybe sometime in 2015, we'll be seeing a CAT 8 wire. And will we ever have a CAT 12? You know, we might. And every time I think the copper guys can't possibly go any faster with copper, they find a way. And... Uh, Another interesting thing I've, uh, uh, I'm learning is that as the RJ45, the connector we use, the modular plugs and jacks, we are beginning to max out the frequency ranges 
that those connectors are uh, uh, really good for because we're, we're talking 500 megahertz and frequencies and beyond. And, and uh, um, so uh, what that new connector is going to end up looking like, I'm not 100% sure. But I'm hearing the CAT8 specifications are going to be using uh, RG45s as well. So we'll see what the future holds for us with those new cables. So that's kind of a little bit of a history of, of uh, what has kind of happened in the past. Now, every time we jump up in frequencies, we have more things we test for that we didn't test for with Cat3 or Cat5e. So, and you'll find the parameters get a little tighter too, as far as how many, uh, how much headroom we can have in that in that uh, particular measurement we're taking. And one new one out there in the industry is called Alien Crosstalk. It's really not new. It's been around a few years, um, and it's interesting. The industry does not tell us how to measure for this. They don't tell us how to test for it. Uh, they just tell us there's one more thing we want to look at when we're installing systems. And uh, we used to always be worried about what's going on within the cable itself, inside the jacketing, not really what's going on outside. So we don't really care what the cables around it are doing in the one in the middle. In, in CAT 6, A and beyond, they are beginning to measure and think about this. So uh, something new is called Alien Crosstalk. Well, so they'll, they'll find a victim pair, usually in the middle of a bundle, and then they'll see what those, say, six uh, uh, pairs around it are doing to that victim pair in the center. And uh, um, a little later on, if we get a chance to talk about certification testing, we could talk about how you go about measuring for this in a building. You'll find out that you cannot do 100% alien crosstalk testing in a building. Almost impossible to do. But you can pick your some fights, so to speak, in a building. And... Uh, um, uh, so, uh, just one more parameter you, you may not have heard of in the past, though, so alien cross -talk. There you go. Now, um, a very important parameter that you should know about any type of cable you buy and install in buildings is what is the UO or, or uh, flame rating of, of, of this particular uh, of cable? What's it rated for as far as the NEC, the National Electric Code, is considered? And, uh, and when you look at the National Electric Code, it basically has four designations here on cabling. And... Uh, the lowest rating is called CMX, and typically I find a, it's limited purpose, and a lot of times I'll find it dual rated where it says CMX slash CMR, which is riser, and a lot of times I find that cable used for indoor-outdoor cables. So you go out the side of a house on the side of the home, go up into the up the side of the home, up into the second floor, come back in the house and start pulling wire again back inside the building. So there is a cable that uh, it actually has a UV inhibitor in it to uh, so the sunlight doesn't break it down, the jacketing in the sunlight. But there's an example of a limited purpose type of cable. Uh, general purpose cable, CMG, a lot of your patch cords are utilized for that. Uh, uh, general purpose cable is typically designed for horizontal runs, not really meant to go vertically through buildings because the way it burns in a fire, it puts off uh, toxic fume and dense smoke and, and things we don't really want burning in a fire, uh, but fine for things like patch cords. Inside of walls, as a general rule, you're going to be told to run wires, riser rated cable, uh, and you'll find it, we'll say CMR on the cable supply. CM stands for communications grade cable, by the way. It might say MPR, which is multi-purpose, but the last letter is the one you want to know, which again tells you what its flame rating is. And uh, Riser cable, supposedly, if you, you know, catch it, if it's going vertically through a building, you catch it on fire on the bottom of the cable, you take the heat source away from it, that flame should go out within a predetermined distance set by UL, and the amount of smoke it puts out should not be as toxic and as dense so you can hopefully see through it in a fire. So there's a, an application for riser ca right, rated cable, and a lot of your applications will be riser rated. The highest rating is plenum. And plenum rated cable can go anywhere in a building. You can go uh, down this or up this list where plenum can be installed anywhere, but uh, riser and general purpose, they all have their place. And so uh, plenum rated cable is usually about three times pri the price of riser, so you'll immediately know you've you, you got plenum in your hand when you look at the bill. And uh, generally you can tell it's plenum because the jacketing on it that makes it plenum rated in many cases does not hold ink very well. And... Uh, You'll notice with those plenum cables, the, the colors are pretty faded. They, you know, blue looks a lot like uh, uh, green, and brown looks a lot like orange. So, yeah, uh, I can quickly tell if it's plenum usually just by how faded the colors look. And plenum ready cable is designed to go through uh, parts of the heating air conditioning system or part of the air plenums in a building. And uh, uh, you'll find a lot of drop ceilings in uh, office buildings are actually just a part of the heating air conditioning system. And there's a blower. 
uh, blowing air across that ceiling or sucking air across that ceiling is pulling air out of the rooms. And so the entire uh, area above the ceiling is part of the heat air conditioning system. And uh, if it, the wire is going to be ran in those kinds of areas, you have to run plug them. And that is probably one thing that your uh, inspector will definitely know uh, is out there in the field. So be uh, looking for that on the cables as well. Very important one to know. Okay. Now, as far as installing cables uh, in buildings, as a general rule, I'm going to tell you to uh, try to be one of the last trades on a job, especially in residential uh, commercial work. That's not going to happen. But uh, uh, because if you're drilling holes and installing wires in a building and you have a large hole drilled and just a few cables passing through it. Somebody coming in behind you can easily add their wires to that opening and maybe cause you some troubles. Also, uh, when you set up things like pulling stations in a building, make sure they're clear of all the other trades and, and people stay out of that area and they're not walking across your cables and potentially damaging uh, your cables as well. And also make sure you're labeling your cable. It's very important to label your cables really on both ends so we know where the end of that cable goes. And follow the 606 labeling uh, scheme I mentioned in one of the earlier uh, uh, videos I had up. But again, just do a nice job installing your cables. And as a general rule, I'm going to tell you, always hide them too. Uh, do not leave cables exposed because people do stupid things like hang Christmas ornaments and other crazy things on cable so and, and end up damaging the cable in the process now as far as handling the cable and getting it ready to be pulled as a general rule we'll tell you to make sure you climatize the cable to the environment that's going to go into um, you know in in most parts of the united states it's not a problem but obviously in the northern parts of the country or obviously up in canada and alaska we can get some very cold environments and that jacket can be damaged in the process of, uh, of really basically taking it off the reel. And, uh, and, and especially in cold weather environments, leaving a little extra slack at connections is not a bad idea. Just for the fear, pure fact that that cable will shrink some, obviously, during the, during the cold span. So you can kind of climatize your cable to the installation. Um, and as far as handling the cable, again, uh, make sure that when you pull the cable off the spool or right out of the box, it's not getting kinked as it comes out. Because in many cases, you're pulling multiple runs of cable at one time, not uh, just one cable at a time kind of thing. And again, you know, make sure when you're pulling around corners, you're using those pulleys and other things to make sure we uh, not damage the cable during the process. Um, and again, don't let it get stepped on or crushed uh, in the pulling station as well. And... Uh, you know, we tell you don't kink your cable, and I'm going to tell you uh, uh, during the process of these classes, if you, if you haven't heard me say it, especially with 10 and 100 base T, you can stomp on that cable. It's probably going to work. Now, nobody recommends this uh, as a general rule, but you'll find it's pretty robust. But uh, uh, anytime you deform or de -shape, the shape of the cable in the process, uh, you're basically causing a bump in the road. And, and, uh, and, and the more we do this, obviously, the more problems we could potentially have. But, uh, uh, again, you know, as a professional installer, the idea is not to damage the cable in the process. That if you're one of those type of folks, uh, well, you, that'll catch up to you sooner or later. So, again, try not to damage the cable in the process. Pulling tension is a really good one to kind of uh, ask people about. It's interesting, you know, as far as pulling tension on the cable, you know, what should that be? Well, the best answer to that is go check with the manufacturer who made the cable. They should probably have a suggestion on how to pull it, especially with fiber optic. You know, you know how do you pull with, you know, obviously with the Kevlar string, not with the fiber. And so they might have some, some tips for you. But uh, the industry says for category wire, uh, four-pair wire, 25 pounds of force. Well, how do you measure that? You know, the answer is they don't. Uh, they, uh, they assume if that cable passes a certification test after you've installed it, uh, you must have pulled it right, right? Uh, and over the years, we've actually tried to come up with a couple different products to, to help measure this, but you just couldn't get anybody to use it. And so um, uh, it's 25 pounds if you haven't heard that. And uh, again, on other cables, check with the manufacturers. And if you're pulling multiple cables together on one pole, what's the number? You know, uh, again, I would suggest you talk to your cable manufacturers. Maybe they will have a suggestion for you. But 25 pounds for a single cable is what the, the standards kind of recommend. Now, when you find routes through a building, as I said earlier, we like to stay out of areas other trades like to be in. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen. But uh, And when you're laying out cables in a building, as I said earlier, make sure they're covered. 
don't leave your cables exposed as a general re- re- uh, 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 as a general rule. Uh, avoid sources of EMI, so you know ballasts, uh, any fixtures or motors or blowers or anything else that might put out a little a lot of EMI. And uh, so, and finding those sources of, of problems uh, can be a lot. I, I got a good buddy of mine that moved into a brand new house, and the TV in the living room would look great as long as you didn't turn on the oven in the kitchen. And uh, obviously, the electrical oven in the kitchen wire was ran very close to the coax, and and uh, it was causing interference. And again, finding those trouble places in a building is almost impossible. Uh, and by the way, that ceiling there is uh, the uh, the uh, drop ceiling is not there to support your 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 cable. Although in a lot of office buildings, you can look ahead above a a drop ceiling, and you're probably going to find wire draped across the top of the ceiling. The standards recommend supporting your cable in the ceilings every four to five feet, and uh, refer to people like Caddy Fasteners for a myriad of different types of. Uh, fasteners they have up for supporting data networking wire in in in, in ceilings like J hooks and other stuff and uh, and again they have a certain design they use to make sure they minimize the uh, um, the um, bear, weight bearing that, that that cable has to tolerate especially if you bundle you know fifty or sixty or hundred cables together uh, and so there's a myriad of ways of hanging that stuff in the ceilings just look into it. Uh, bending radius is on cable again. We, as a general rule on UTP cable, we say it's four times the diameter of the cable, so whatever that happens to be. And uh, a lot of your category cable are roughly a quarter inch, and so four times that is an inch. That's the radius of the bend, not the diameter. So, uh, so uh, uh, it's a one inch radius. Now, if you bend it, the co- the uh, category wire in a loop, how tight's that loop? It's a, basically a two inch loop is the tightest they want you to bend it. Believe it or not. And, of course, CAT6A wire and bigger conductors or, or cables are even a little bit more than that. Uh, STP is eight times the outer diameter, and I'm not 100% sure. Probably something to do with the foil uh, shield inside the uh, cable not being deformed, uh, but it, they're eight times on, on the STP-type cables. Um, when you're bundling cable together, and, you know, what do you use to bundle it together with? There's, a, again, a, a lot of different devices out there today you'll find from basically, you know, cable ties to Velcro cable ties, and there's some actually very cool wire management uh, devices they use today to help help straighten out that bundle and make it look nice and neat. Um, Over the years, we've learned not to pinch the cables uh, with the cable ties and deform the shape of them. That's not good. We want the cable to be uh, tied to be snug, but not damaging the cables. Uh, We used to like to make really nice tight bundles out of these cables and make that bundle look really neat. And they're finding out with Cat 6A, as I mentioned earlier, with Alien and Crosstalk being one more thing we're looking at, they're telling you not to bundle them so tight. Uh, so uh, depending on your cable, you know, how do you wire, how handle that wire management is kind of up to, to the particular job. And again, if you're putting cable t- ties up in a, in, a, in a drop seal or something like that, you probably ought to be using uh, plenum-ready cable ties to do that. So there's a, a lot of different ways of making sure you're, you're uh, uh, managing that cable bundle properly and not damaging it in the process. Now, as I said earlier, make sure your cables are never exposed because one main thing that happens to them over time, it's going to happen, is they're going to get painted. And when those cables get painted, that basically ruins any fire rating on them and any warranty you might have gotten from a, a manufacturer out there on the cable installation. So um, uh, just be aware of, again, try not to leave them exposed and uh, because, again, eventually <laughs> they will get painted. I can almost guarantee it. Now, cable slack at uh, either back at at the telecommunication outlet or back in a telecommunications room has changed from what we used to think about 15, 20 years ago. And uh, so today, the standards basically recommend that if you're in a telecommunications rack, no more than 10 feet of cable or about 3 meters is left coiled up above the rack someplace, okay, for moves, adds, and changes that might happen to happen somewhere down the road. Now, at a telecommunication outlet in a room... The suggestion is above, up in the ceiling, no more than about one meter or three feet of slack. Now, at the telecommunications outlet, we will say no more than about basically a foot, eight to 12 inches or a foot of slack in order to re-terminate that particular outlet. And if you ever had to, you might pull down some more from up in the ceilings. Now, as you can see on this slide, you got all these bundles up above in the ceiling. There's a bunch of coiled up bundles up there, right? You know, that's a very common practice for from years gone by. And uh, because, especially in, a, in, a, in an office building, and you've got a partitionable furniture underneath the ceiling, 
and its furniture is going to get moved occasionally and having an extra 50 or 100 foot coiled up above in the ceiling especially if you're nowhere near the 90 meter rule on, a, on, a, on that particular cable run was nice to have because you would not have to pull a new wire off the rack to to move that particular uh, office so uh, that was a very common practice now as we progressed in speeds and frequencies keep going up and up Today, we're telling you that that's not a very good practice because that 100 ohms I talk about, that impedance, there's, there's three factors to that. One's called inductive, one's called resistive, and one's called uh, capacitive reactance. And actually, capacitive reactance is the big one, but uh, uh, one is inductive reactance. And as you coil that cable up, the, what happens is those magnetic fields are ad adding up, and you're changing what's called the inductance in the cabling, which is affecting that 100 ohm thing. So... Uh, that's why they tell you don't do this anymore and they tell you if you're going to install uh, excess cable up in them ceilings uh, and you go beyond the 10 feet then you start putting in um, uh, stored in a, a, in a loop figure kind of a figure eight type of figure uh, and that will help uh, stop those magnetic fields from uh, adding up like that in the in 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 that coil. So uh, put it basically in a figure eight if you're going to put a whole lot of slack up there in the ceilings. Okay, but uh, that's kind of a big one that's changed in the last 15, 20 years that we always did. Okay, and then lastly, when we look at terminating the cables and we put a connector on the end of this wire, you'll find all the connections you run across will tell you to leave no more than a half inch of slack, uh, either a patch panel or a jack or in a modular plug, when uh, terminating the ends of the cattery wire. And as I said earlier, you can kink it, you can knot it, you can bend it in a lot of cases and things work fine. Uh, just don't untwist it. And you'll never retwist that wire like the machine twisted it and technically it's supposed to be twisted at a very specific rate. Uh, throughout the entire length of the cable, uh, although uh, if you retwist the, ca the cable, would it pass a certification test? It might, uh, and probably would, but uh, just be aware of a half inch is the maximum we're allowed to leave untwisted per connection when we're working out in the field, okay? Um, well, I hope that helped a lot for you, uh, and we'll move on to the next segment, uh, which I'm not quite sure what that is, but we'll figure that out, and if you haven't done it, do me a favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel, folks. I really do appreciate you all watching that thing, um, and I'm always surprised at how many of you all do watch it. So, again, uh, if you haven't been to my channel, please subscribe. And thanks for watching again. I appreciate it. And my name is Ron with Ideal, and I'll plan on seeing you hopefully on the next one.